So, so begins our time to talk about diagnoses and descriptions and the type of information that we'll see. And I think one thing that I'd like you all to keep in your mind as you're listening today is thinking about tomorrow and thinking about the next week. So thinking about the types of information that you collect when you go out into the field and how that information will be used later on. So there's many uses for that information we'll get from surveys and inventories. But an important part of that information can be used for species descriptions, right? When you get back to the lab and you want to say what color it was in life and you didn't have, you hadn't taken a picture of it, you know, when it was fresh, you know, then you're going to have lost that opportunity. So you need to take notes and take photographs and those things in the field. So hopefully as we go through the next three presentations, you can keep that piece of information in your mind and think about, you know, how would we actually go through in, during field work to collect that information. So I'm going to give a couple sort of general comments, but then be speaking specifically with examples that come from how we describe frog species. So this is just gives you a sense just to remind you of things that are important. So the scientific description needs to appear in a peer-reviewed scientific publication published somewhere and disseminated in the world. So this is just an example of two species I've described from this region, one here in Cameroon, Nigeria, one on Bioko, the island off the coast. They need to be formed collect correctly. Both of these are nouns in apposition, so they don't have to be Latinized because they're nouns. So one of them is palava and one of them is Bioko. And you know, they also do, you can give them a common name in those publications too, right? So you have the freedom to do that. It's not a necessity. This is the problem or problematic squeaker frog. This is a species that was confused with other species for about 50 years. And that was why we chose Palava. And then sometimes you see these other details. This is how it was referred to previously in a publication before it was published and the type material. So that's great. That satisfies you know, all of those pieces of the code. And then the last important piece is taking the diagnosis, right? And here in the paper, it calls it out diagnosis, right? This is the diagnosis. This is the part where I say how it's different from other species. And I'll get to the rest of this in a, a few minutes. But here in the beginning, I'm just going to read this to you because this, this satisfies the, the issue for the um, this satisfies the criteria by the code to make it available. It is a medium small arthroleptus distinguished from other arthroleptus by the combination of body size, color patterns of the venter, the ventral side, and the head, and a relatively short, or in this case a stout, hind limb, and a prominent inner metatarsal tubercle. These are all pieces of information that we tend to talk about for frogs. And here I've you know, said this combination of traits that it is distinctive relative to all these other species, right? But I didn't really say how it differed from any specific species. This is a large genus. There's about 50 species in the genus. And you want to know, of course, you know, how does it differ from this other species I'd find in Cameroon or other species that I'd find of similar body size, things like that. So how do we decide on the species for comparison? This is a really important point to think about before you start down the road of describing your species, right? If you're describing a frog, do I want to compare it to all 6,500 other species of frogs? It's going to be a very long paper, right? No, we tend not to do that. We tend to, you know, compare it to other species in the genus. If we can diagnose this thing as being in this genus, then we've immediately discarded all of the rest of the diversity in that group, right? So when I can say, you know, it's diagnosable by being an arthroleptus by some set of traits, or even by, by just simply saying, you know, based on genetic data, it's more similar to arthroleptus than other ones, we can use that type of argument as well. Once we get it into the genus, then suddenly, you know, we're talking about comparisons to other members of the genus, right? We could also say closer to related species. And so I'll show you an example of that as well. There's 50 species of arthroleptus in this genus, what are the other species that are really closely related to it, and how does it differ from those specific species that it's most closely related to? Other things that are really useful from the point of view of a, another biologist, speaking from you as a biologist to another person that's a biologist, is yes, they're probably interested in, you know, what are the nearest relatives, but if we're in Cameron and its nearest relative is in, say, Tanzania, you're not going to show up in Cameroon and be confused about which one it is, right? Because its nearest relative is on the other side of the continent. What you might be more interested in is, you know, how do I tell it apart from species it's similar to, right? I want to make sure that I have the right one. So things that look like it, how do I distinguish it from those? As well as species that 
occur in the same site, same country, same region, right? From a field biology point of view, this is really important. Even though it might be, you know, incredibly distantly related from the species that you're describing, it might look like it, right? And so the most important criterion for you in the field is try to, you know, how do you tell these two things apart, right? You don't have genetic data in the field to say, oh, it's not that other species, right? You're, you're going based on what they look like. So the truth is that there's no right answer. The code doesn't give you a right answer. Um, certain fields have best practices, but there's not really something that's required, right? And so I don't know about for, Town and what Town and Mark do, but I probably Rafe and I are pretty similar at least in picking a combination of these things, right? There's the things that it's like, how do you know it's this genus? What's it closely related to that you can tell it apart? You know, if you're in the Philippines, how do you tell it apart from other, you know, little Philippine brown lizards that might look really similar, even though they're not closely related? In some cases, it might be a different genus, right? It might be a different genus that actually looks really similar and, you know, how would you tell it apart from that genus? That, that could be a piece of information you have in there as well. So really, some combination of these choices is what's probably best for writing your species descriptions. Realize that none of these are required by the code, just to reiterate that point. But think about your speaking as a scientist to another scientist, and you're trying to kind of help them as much as possible when they follow up on your work. So this is what really more or less satisfies the code, but from the point of view of you know, scientific knowledge, other things are important. So here I distinguish this species from other Arthroleptus that it was closely related to. And now these aren't all here. Two of them are, this species Peretti and Variabilis. Those are here in this region. But Crocosua is actually in Ghana, right? So it's actually far away, but it is closely related to them. And I've pointed out how it differs in body size. Then I've also basically taken all these other things that are possibly easily confused because of similar body size, even though they're not closely related, they could be elsewhere in Africa, and pointed out for each of these species other traits, right? So it's different from Arthroleptus francii, which occurs in Melange in Malawi, uh, by having a relatively larger intermetatarsal tubercle and generally having this fragmented band, this dark band over its tympanum, right? So in each one of these, I've made comparisons. In some cases, um, let's see what's a good example. And here for Crocosua, I've actually never seen the types, type and only specimen for a few years. There's a few more specimens now. I've never seen it in person, right? So I, can't, I can only use the literature and say, OK, well, it's at least smaller than what's reported in the literature. In other cases, you know, I've been able to examine specimens either from my own collections or other people's collections to piece together these pieces of information about how it differs, right? So what are the really quite the recipe for a good species description? This is kind of general. This is not only specific to frogs, but I'm going to give you sort of the examples we use in frogs in a moment. So a lot of these pieces of information you're going to get from the field, right? To fully describe a new species, you want to really describe it. There's the diagnosis, where you say how it's different from other things, but then also the description. You want to actually be able to convey in words what does it look like. It's really not sufficient to say, you know, it differs from all these other species by the fact that it has spines, and here's a picture of it. That won't pass review, probably. You know, it won't actually be published based on that. You can't just rely on a picture and just hope that everyone else can see the same features that you do. You really need to have a full description. In some cases, Rafe and I, for instance, will talk about features on the inside of the mouth that you can't see. It's hard to show in a photograph. Sometimes we can include an illustration, but sometimes we actually just really describe you know, the patterns that we see that otherwise are really hard to show someone but if you looked with your own specimen in hand and looked at it closely, you'd be able to make those comparisons based on what we've written. So, you know, just features in general that are used, body size is very common, right? If you have a very small species, obviously it's, you know, useful to distinguish from very large species based on that information. Body shape, and this can become quite sophisticated, which I'll show you at the end. Uh, coloration. And this is really where your photograph from the field come in, right? If you want to prove to someone that you have a red bird and the colors change after you've preserved animals, right? This is a, a, a big problem for us. It's also a problem even in, you know, fruits. Colors change once they're preserved. You want to be able to tell someone what it looks like actually in nature, not what it looks like after it's sat on the shelf for 100 years. 
Right? And as Mark, if you remember when Mark began and kicked off um, this week's lectures, he referred to some species that are called pallidus, right? They look pale. That's what was the scientific name given to those specimens in the museum collections. Well, why do they look pale? That's because they've sat in a museum drawer or they've had light damage over many, many years, right? And so it's changed the coloration of them. So when we're in the field, we need to have good photographs of what these species look like alive. If you collect very few specimens, I'd expect that you would have a photograph of every one of those. If you go out and have an amazing night looking for things and you've caught a hundred different things, what we tend to do is take at least representative photographs of some of those specimens. It's sometimes not feasible to take an image of every single photograph of every single animal in life. You just have to make those judgment calls and we'll talk about that while we're doing field work. And of course, we also use images of preserved specimens in addition to the color, one, uh, color photographs. And the reason that we do that, we have you know, images a lot of times of what they look like alive and images of what they look like dead, is because right, we're all making collections. We all have a lot of dead things. And sometimes we need to actually be able to make comparisons to what it looks like after it's been sitting in alcohol for 50 years. Right? So we also have details like that. One of the things that's really important from um, field studies is the distribution. We want to know where the specimens of this species occur, right? You did field work, you know, we're going to corrupt national park. We have some point localities that we'll take with our GPS. We want to be able to map those localities, map them in relationship to other species to know, you know, does that species co-occur with another species that's similar, right? We can show this using our data that we get from the field, data from museum collections. And these are basically coming from field notes. You know, information on the habitat, information on the ecology of these animals. For frogs, an example would be, you know, what do they perch on to call? You know, are they calling from the ground when they're making noise? Like a toad, right? So a lot of the toads that you can even hear uh, recently in Boya, and the ones that go wah, 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 they're calling from the ground, you know? They're not calling from the top of a tree. And there's other things that are calling from the very tops of trees around bushes and things like that. And those are all coming from our field notes when we actually report them in the literature, right? So it's important to have these detailed field notes to be able to say something about the ecology and biology of these animals in the field. We also, of course, note differences between males and females, right? That's really significant information because there's certainly groups of organisms where the females all look the same and the males look different. <laughs> Or, actually in Cameroon, we have a lot of cases where a lot of the males of species of reed frog look the same, they're all lime green, and the females are really wildly different from each other, right? So if we describe all those species based on green males, it's actually really hard to tell them apart. But when we characterize the differences within a species between males and females, and we put that together across species, then we can really start to understand how these species can be told apart in nature. You know, something that also is included, and I wrote this in a very general way, is changes that occur during development. So in the, to give the specific example, within uh, frogs, right, we have species that have tadpoles, a lot of frogs, although not all frogs have tadpoles. And a lot of tadpoles can be, uh, tadpoles of different species can look different from one another. So even having that life history data is actually very important for discriminating between the species. There can be cases where the tadpoles look really different and the adults look similar, and there can be cases where the adults look really different, but the tadpoles look similar. You know, a parallel within the ornithological world would be the fact that, you know, birds as they molt change the color and pattern that they look like, right, in some cases. So having any of that information is not necessary but certainly, you know, speaking from a biologist to a biologist, having as much of that information as possible in a species description can be really helpful for discriminating it from other species. And last is really this almost a general catch-all of natural history. You know, to the extent that we have, you know, information on the diet, we can include that. You know, the fact that you caught the species and it was eating another one uh, can be significant. I mean, pieces of information like that in some cases can be significant to the diagnosis, but in a lot of cases they're just simply useful for fully characterizing what is this species. And just realize that you don't have to have all of these pieces of information. This is just sort of the recipe that you might have for a, you know, a really rich and high quality species description is tying together a lot of these pieces of information. Rafe and I have both described species based on single specimens that were really different from other ones, based on genetics or based on anatomy. 
And so we really couldn't talk about most of this, right? We couldn't talk about variation. We couldn't talk about its call if it's been sitting on a museum collection shelf for 80 years. We don't know what it looked like alive. We have very basic habitat information. But we can still give the species a description that satisfies the code and tells people how it differs from, a, each, from other species, but it really doesn't have the richness of detail that you could have if you're collecting those yourself in the field. So I'm going to just walk through a few of these just to give examples of what they look like in a description and how we're using them. So fully describing the species. One of the things that we see in a lot of the literature is a full description of the holotype. Not a full description of every single specimen in the type series, but a full description of the holotype, and then comments on variation among the paratypes, right? That's a very common practice. So you see the description of the holotype, then you see a section on variation where it talks about the range of color differences or size differences or shape differences among the other specimens you have available for that species. And so here, you know, it begins as a medium small, gives a snout vent length, robust and slightly globular female with stout legs, Right? This is the super detailed view of what this one dead frog looks like. Right? So it might seem absurd how detailed it is, but in fact these details can be really important to the next scientist who comes along and says, oh, well that's really interesting, and the frog I have, this one is the eye diameter is 2.3 times the inarial distance, oh, and in mine it's only 0.5. Right? And so this might not be information that's otherwise reported in the paper as significant for telling species apart, but having that really rich detailed description enables you, if you don't have access to this type, to make those detailed comparisons to the thing you have in hand. Right? So we talk about resources and how we may not be able to access type specimens. That's true for you as much as it's true for us. There are certain museum collections where we can't access the collection, we can't go visit them, they won't send it to us on loan, and so we're stuck depending on them either sending us a picture and or you know, going to the original description. And the richer this description is, the easier it is for another person to sit down with their own specimens and compare to what you have, right? So that's, that's the point of writing these really detailed descriptions. And there, if you look around in the literature, you can usually find people to emulate. So when I first started writing species descriptions, I actually based some of mine on Wraith's work and some on another colleague named Brian Stewart. And I cobbled together my own format, my own style of doing this based on you know, using these other very rich species descriptions. Of course, we also talk about color. So here's a, a color photograph that was taken in the field on that white background right, that I showed you. Uh, that we use in the field, so that's what it would look like in the paper. It talks about the coloration in life. It actually references uh, differences. Uh, here's a few specimens that are actually specifically referenced about you know, what um, some of these stripes look like when they're present. Also has a really detailed description of what the holotype looks like. And normally when we're doing this, we describe not just what it looks like in one view. You know, so here's what it looks like in dorsal view. There's a pale stripe going down its back. We see a very sort of a weakly developed pale stripe here on its uh, throat, and that's actually significant for this species. We show you know, that it actually has spots that are continuing onto the belly. We also will look at it in, in, the, in lateral view, and we'll show you know, the stripes and the dots that are around its tympanum. That's its external ear, what you can see for the ear. Um, features like that. We'll talk about little tiny spots that are on its hind limb. Thing, I mean, it's a whole variety of traits. And in some cases, there's not necessarily a basis for you to look at someone else's description and say what's going to be significant about yours. So it's really if just kind of looking across your specimens, comparing to the literature, comparing to other specimens, where you really develop the fact, the knowledge enough to say, oh, actually, this species is really significant because it has these very strange white tubercles on this one part of its leg, right? So when I put this in a paper that wasn't like I was basing that on anyone's previous work, that was just based on my own observations of realizing that this particular species was really distinctive for this one trait, right? So in, um, in at least the amphibian literature, one thing that, especially frog literature, what we tend to show and figure a lot are, this is the underside of the hands, this is the palm of the hand, the underside of the foot, right? Looking at it from the bottom, this is from Rafe's paper. Um, and so we will characterize things like the shape, number, and size of these tubercles that are on the palm of the hand. We will characterize you know, whether or not these little white dots, those, that's a tubercle underneath the joint of each finger. right? And we'll characterize you know, how big is it? Is it present? 
Is it one tubercle or is it two tubercles? There are certain frogs that actually have pairs going down their fingers. We'll also characterize the shape and size of the ends of the toes. So as we'll hopefully see in the field, some, um, some species that climb trees, that live in bushes, have the ends of their toe tips expanded. So it kind of looks like a little fan at the end. Terrestrial frogs tend to have a very narrow toe tip, right? So sometimes, even if you have no habitat and ecology information, and it's been in a collection for 100 years, you can still guess at that information based a little bit on what the anatomy is, right? So if you found a frog that had hugely expanded toe pads at the end of its toes, you might make a guess that this is an arboreal frog, although that doesn't always hold, but it's at least a guess based on its ecology. It's a guess of its ecology based on its anatomy. Another feature of amphibians that we tend to use a lot is whether or not the, the, there's webbing in between the toes, right? And within amphibians, we even have a formula that's used for denoting the pattern of the webbing among them. It's more detailed than simply saying lots of webbing or no webbing, right? We can actually say the extent to which the webbing connects between the toes and how much of the distal end of the toes are free of webbing. So for those of you that are really interested in that detail, we can talk about that in the field about how we could characterize that. Another thing that's really important for certain fields of uh, zoology is this type of information, and these are calls. And so this is actually taken from um, a paper of Rafe's, and Rafe will, in the field, be showing you how to record calls and how do we begin thinking about taking call data. Remember that Rafe talked about not only um, noting things about you know, the habitat and the environment and the date, but also the temperature of the frogs, right? And so all of that information can be used in species descriptions for describing, not only in terms of what the call sounds like, so sometimes there's verbal descriptions that'll say, this frog sounds like creak, 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 and it'll be written out like that. There's a lot of older literature that that's all it says. But newer literature can say that, but then in addition actually describe the call analytically. It'll say the, the mean frequency of the call. So this is, there's images that often appear in amphibian papers and also bird papers that show an audio spectrogram. So that's actually showing the frequency through time. And remember that Rafe showed those, um, those calls that had more than one syllable. So they have two frequencies kind of connected to each other as part of the call. And so you can get that information just by looking at these plots once you become familiar with what they're showing. This is an oscillogram that's actually showing the way in which the, the amplitude of the call is changing through time, essentially the loudness, right? Another feature that's common to many of these is actually just this very exhaustive list of measurements of an animal. So Rafe will show examples of counting things as well. Uh, so, you know, we have a set of measurements. I think um, Cece asked about measurements at some point during this. So we have a lot of sets of measurements characterizing how big it is, how big its head is, how big its ear is, how big its eye is, how long its fingers are, how long its legs are. There's a lot of information there. We don't necessarily, in all cases, make use of this in the paper, but we present it and we give it so that you know, the next scientist that comes along is making a comparison to what he found can you know, use this data to make a comparison. And here you see the holotype and then measurements for all of these paratypes at different institutions here at the MCZ at Harvard. Uh, this one is in the Czech Republic. This one is in Copenhagen. So we're, you know, this is having details, uh, museum details from other places. Last, um, again, is distribution in natural history. These dots are showing, you know, where it was found, sort of roughly estimated potential distribution. We're also saying, you know, the potential elevational range of this species, uh, the base, basically just on our field data, right? We know it occurred in this place, in this case, in this place, and in those places range between 1,000 meters and 1,900 meters. It begins to give us some sense, not only in terms of, you know, space, you know, in a straight line, but also space in terms of elevation, right? What is the elevational range of the species? And that's important information, right? Almost all of you live in countries with big mountains, Right? So you're interested, is this a montane species or is this not a montane species? That's important information to convey. Things that can appear in species descriptions and often do now are phylogenies, right? So Rafe talked about evolutionary relationships yesterday. And this is a statistical analysis of just shape variation. And so on the, on the left, when we have an evolutionary tree, the reason that I included this particular thing in this paper was that this species that occurs in Cameroon, it occurs even here in Boya, and this species that occurs in the mountains, 
they look really, really similar to one another. You can tell them apart, but part of the exercise here was to show that while they may look similar to each other, they're actually very distantly related to one another. This one here is related to things that occur in lowlands throughout West Africa, whereas this one is actually related to a group of large-bodied things that tends to occur in mountains, but also very distinctive things in the lowlands. So, while they look similar, they're very different from each other. So phylogenies can be used to show that information or simply just to put it in the tree and show what it's related to. In this case, you'll see each of these are holotypes. And so what I included here was measurements of holotypes to compare it to the holotypes and paratypes of a new species to these triangles, just to show that you can see in this plot that these are very different from these, right? You can tell them apart based on their shape, and that was, you know, the shape was actually part of the diagnosis of this species. I think this might be my last slide. Just other types of information that you should include. So you'll often see an etymology section, right? So it's actually describing what does that specific epithet that you chose, and presumably formed cor correctly and grammatically according to the rules, what does it mean? In this particular case, it was picking palava just because it you know, denotes uh, a problem in pigeon, right? Here, uh, conservation. This is not a necessary part, but is also a useful piece of information, right? I mean, a lot of us are interested in the conservation of these species, so to the extent that we can, this is not an official thing, right? This is not, the IUCN does not automatically adopt whatever you write in your paper. But, you know, if it was a critically endangered species that you think occurs you know, on one mountain in one forest reserve, that's significant, right? You should include that type of information in the paper and to the best of your ability provide some suggestion of you, know, you think it's threatened or not. And here you know, we suggest in fact that this thing basically occurs in towns and eucalyptus forests. Uh, it's pretty common. This is probably a least concerned species, right? So we included that here, but you can imagine cases where they're critically endangered and one value of describing species, Caleb, we talked about this for Ghana, is having descriptions of species that actually play into the conservation of parks and forest reserves, right? Because they're found only in that particular place. And last, and this is actually significant, although sometimes uh, doesn't get as much attention as it should, is it's very, very useful to later scientists to note what specimens did you look at, right, when you did this. So when I diagnosed, you know, this species from Arthroleptus brevipes, what did I look at? This is a species that previously was known only from a type, so there's the holotype, but I also looked at these other recently correct, collected ones. So what if I'm wrong? What if I only collected or data for these recently collected ones and it turned out they were totally the different species, right? It would provide a scientist in the future with that information to know, okay, well, Blackburn looked at these two things and he thought that was brevipes and that was how you told it apart from brevipes. But in fact, you know, he was totally wrong. These aren't brevipes, these are francii or something like that, right? So it, it's giving that extra information to help people in the future understand why you were right or in some cases why you were wrong by having these specimens examined as part of that. So that's what I have for now and hopefully will be enough detail to kind of kick off the next two, next two talks. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Moses. I guess I'll walk over to you. Yeah, my question looks general. Mm -hmm. I don't know how how you pull with, with herbs, how you how you treat such a case. If, for example, if you are doing sampling and realize that you have um, just a female species and it turns out to be a new species, or you have just a male species yeah. and it turns out to be new, and you scan over the years, you keep the species and so I'll get a male or get a female, and over the years you, you never come across a male or female, what do you do? You abandon it or you go ahead and describe it? Yeah, so that, okay, that's a good question. So in some cases, the question really is kind of focused on, you know, do you need a male and a female of a species to describe it, right? Yeah. Um, and that's certainly preferred, right? It's, and depending on the group of organisms you work on, so if you work on birds, right, males can be very colorful, have lots of specific traits to each species that are, you know, unique to males. Whereas if you worked on Cameroonian reed frogs, having females is really important because that's, you know, the females show the color and pattern that really helps to tell species apart. While it's preferred to have a male and a female, 
of the species in the species descriptions, it's not, it's not required. Uh, and so, I mean, I don't know, I've described species based on one sex or the other just because that's all we ever had available. We might even have a big series, but they're all females for whatever reason, right? And that happens. And sometimes you have to work with what you have. So we might, be able to, we might not be able to give you know, the diagnoses for the male traits, but to the extent that we can, we can do it on the females. Now it's an important question because depending on the group of organisms you work on, it may be that the most valuable diagnostic traits are in the males or in the females. And so, you know, for instance, in old collections, we have a lot of cases where, you know, if you worked on certain groups of frogs, having the males is actually preferable just simply because they have the traits that you can tell apart, right? In the absence of calls, in the absence of color, in the absence of genetics, the males have specific traits that are unique among the species, right? So like patterns of spines on the hand or something. So if you had a female, you wouldn't really have any of that information, right? So you could describe a species in those cases just based on the male because it would be enough information, right? But if you had the females, you'd be left wondering, you know, is this really a real thing or not, right? So that's, while it's preferred to have them, it's not a necessity to have both. Yeah, my second question. <laughs> yes, Moses. Um, I, I mean, we of the plant background, we, we, are, we are so fond of ethnobotany. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year I was, reading, I was reading a presentation that somebody presented on medicinal wildlife mm -hmm. parts. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask if, if you people, you have something like, like edible frogs. I'm, I'm also saying this because last July I was on Mount Rata mm -hmm. with Jacob. Mm -hmm. And just from the summit, our guide was ahead. And I didn't even see the frog, but I just realized blood speeding a, a, apart. I didn't mm -hmm. see how the frog jumped, yep. but our guide was ahead, and I just realized blood. Yep. And the guide ran and said, hey, that's it, that's it. He caught the frog, and I said, what are you doing? He said, no, we are eating this frog. Mm -hmm. It's edible in this area. So I took a lot of pictures, and um, oh. yeah, yeah, I have the pictures of mine. So now I, I want to ask if you pull, you, you, you do things like um, edible frogs? Sure, so we certainly will include in a species description, should we have it, uh, some sense of the relationship of that species to the people there, whether or not they use it for food, whether or not they use it for traditional medicine, or whether or not they may even just simply have some beliefs about this, you know, about being good luck or fearing it. So, you know, Rafe, I believe, gave an example, I don't know if this was in class or otherwise, about a big monitor lizard that he described called Bidatawa. And that name was actually the local people's name for that animal, right? So they could tell it apart. They knew it apart from the other monitor lizards. And so he actually used that knowledge and their local name for the species name, right? So he was able to include that in there. For a lot of cases in Cameroon, there's actually a lot of species of frogs that are eaten. Um, quite a few, and including a number of endemics. But in a lot of cases, that was discovered many decades after those species were first described. Yeah, um, but it's a good question. Her, um, amphibians and reptiles and even birds, of course, are, are eaten. And even in the bird world, they even sometimes have a history of eating the specimens as they're preparing them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the only thing you can eat. Yeah. That's why Tom likes chicken so much. Caleb. If you, if you found, uh, okay, you did all the diagnosis and yeah. took all the measurements, and then there was no difference, okay, but the genetics clearly shows that this is hugely uh -huh. different from all other related species. Will you still go ahead and describe it and how will you do that? Yes, so what if you can't tell them apart no matter what you do, but genetically they're really different? Well, that happens sometimes, and it's sort of, I mean, if it's really distinct from all other described species, and say it's, it's, it has no close relationship to anything, say it's sister to an entire clade of things that have names, we can show based on relationships that it, it must fundamentally be its own species, right? And then it becomes a struggle and sort of some judgment calls about, you know, what type of information do we try and use? How do we try and diagnose it? Um, 
we can show based on what we understand about relationships that it simply must be a new species, but in a lot of cases we're left with not understanding or maybe have inadequate ways of diagnosing it, right? Um, we can still provide some diagnosis by simply, you know, the evolution of relationships, um, but, you know, we'd prefer to have more information as much as we can. But it, it can become difficult, you know? Certainly there's a lot of species like that. Yeah. Okay. You have a second question? Yeah. yeah. Go for it. Sure. Much. There was uh, someone asking me a question. Of course, I, I still don't fully understand the question, but maybe you will. <laughs> maybe. He, um, we did some population genetics, and then we thought that the difference between the two populations was hugely you know, significant, mm. and then warrants possible new species. And he was like, uh, sometimes populations are fragmented and they form haplotypes and blah, blah, I really don't know what that means. And so we should be careful. And sure. Blah, blah, blah. Well, so, okay, that's great. So that gets more into just the specifics of how to deal with genetic data. And so there has been in certain fields, um, what are referred to as cutoffs. So there's some sense of, you know, beyond a certain percent divergence that, you know, they must be new species. But the reality is that, of course, you, as you noted, that there can be a lot of structure within species. Um, and so just in the interest of time, seeing that town gave me that indication, it's a longer conversation, just about the different tools that we can use um, for telling things apart. And sometimes we require more data, different types of genetic data to be able to do that. Yeah. And Rafe and I can spend time talking with you about it more if you'd like. Yeah. So should we just wrap up? Yeah. That's a hairy frog.